Up next, a young woman has car trouble and disappears. A gentleman in a van pulled up and offered his assistance. Eyewitnesses give differing accounts of what happened. It is frustrating when witnesses tell us variations that don't add up. A microscopic clue underneath the girl's fingernails and a bite mark provide needed clues. But were they enough? This could have been prevented. My sister could be here with me right now. The Faith Tabernacle Church is an institution in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. There are about a thousand members, among them the De Costa family. Church for us was not only a place to go to worship and serve God, but it was actually a place to go and socialize, see your friends. The De Costa daughters, Rochelle and Darnia, attended church three or four times a week and they usually went together. But one December night, Donya decided to go alone since her sister had homework to do. That was the last time the family saw Donya alive. My mom knocked on the door, asked me if my sister is home. She's not home. I started thinking, oh my God, something is wrong. Donya's family drove all over the area looking for her. I didn't find her. I went to the church. I didn't find her. And then on my way back, I found her car. She was not in her car. They found Donya's car two miles from home on the shoulder of a major highway. I had a dream, and I knew something was wrong. The car was out of gas. There was a prior incident with the car where she actually ran out of gas before. So that, that could have been the same problem. We discovered that Dania always carried a, a gas can in the back of her trunk. That gas can was missing. Witnesses at a nearby gas station a half mile away said they saw someone who matched Dania's description. She did come to the Texaco gas station and used her credit card to purchase gas. She purchased over a dollar's worth of gas to fill the gas can to go put gas back in her vehicle. And witnesses said that Donya wasn't alone. A gentleman in a van pulled up and offered his assistance to Donia. According to the witnesses, this gentleman told Donia that he would be able to take her back to her car and help her out. Witnesses were able to describe the driver to police who created a composite drawing. Both witnesses said that the male driver was a black man in his 40s, late 30s, early 40s, very well dressed, very articulate, very well spoken. Unfortunately, the witnesses disagreed about the color of the vehicle. One said it was teal blue, the other indicated it was burgundy. Both witnesses confident in their answers, both steadfast. As to the color, it could be either one. It could be burgundy, it could be teal. The gas station surveillance cameras were no help. The van was apparently outside of camera range. One of the witnesses remembered seeing the word hope painted on the side of the van. You just don't come up with a word. Even though the colors were different from each description that was recalled by the witnesses, the word hope, in my mind, was going to be on that van somewhere. Police decided not to release this detail to the media, but the van was the only clue investigators had. Normally, having two witnesses to a possible kidnapping would be a good thing for investigators, but not in Doña de Costa's case. Both witnesses saw the same thing but each gave a different description of the van in which Donya was last seen alive. They described the van in various ways regarding the colors and regarding the signage that was on the, sign of, on the side of the van. I can't pick my witnesses. I have to work with what I have. Since one of the witnesses said the word hope was on the side of the van, 
Detectives Kaminsky and Bukata contacted every organization in the area with the word hope in its name. There were more than a hundred of them. I call everybody, I call the rest of my family. And we started printing flyers with a picture and started handing them out to people all over. Then, three days after Dornia disappeared, a worker at an industrial park 20 miles away found Dornia's body near a dumpster. The female was wrapped in sheets as well as a shower curtain, and her head was covered with a bag. The news was on TV, and I remember them coming on and said there was a body discovered in Oakland Park. And then my sister face popped up on the screen. And I was like, oh, no. I said, I hope that's not her body. I hope that's not her body. I was in the room, and I looked among the people, and I saw all these police coming, and the chaplain, another chaplain, and I saw them coming. I said, oh, my god. Oh my God, that's Daniel. And he came in and told me. Dornia was nude and had brown carpet fibers on her body. The medical examiner estimated Dornia was murdered just hours after she disappeared. The state of decomposition was around 36 hours. This was our best estimate. Investigators noticed a tire impression on the sheet covering Dornia's body. To have her just wrapped up in sheets and tossed out like a piece of garbage was really troubling. There was some uh, debris-laden tire tracks across the pavement, and it also went across the leg portion of the sedent where she had been wrapped in the sheet, and it was actually on the surface of the sheet. The sheet was a dark brown, rusty color, which made it difficult to obtain a clear image of the tire impression. The impression was faint, uh, black rubber on top of that material. And in order to get the best contrast out of that, we used various light sources to try and reduce the actual color of the sheet while bringing up the contrast of the actual impression, which was black. The images were photographed in both black and white and in color. Analyst Mark Sukamel was able to get an image of the tread. Unfortunately, it wasn't large enough to figure out the make and model of the tire. Investigators also used super glue fuming to look for prints on the plastic bags and shower curtain that encased Donya's body. They found six partial prints and two full prints. These were submitted to our latent fingerprint people. There was a search done in our automated uh, fingerprint system and came up with no matches. The medical examiner discovered that Darnia had been sexually assaulted and tortured. There were more than three dozen star-shaped wounds on her chest. Those injuries in the area of the chest were superficial. In other words, they didn't penetrate the chest wall didn't enter the body cavities and did not contribute to death. It's as if the killer was on top of the young lady and just stabbing her to cause her pain. The cause of death was a blow to her skull with the same star-shaped instrument. The stab wound to the skull actually went through her skull as if it was the final coup de grace, which took her life. Near the fatal wound was an odd horseshoe-shaped bruise no one could tell what caused it. What did she do to deserve such a horrible death? The killer left a bite mark on Dornia's right arm. Dr. Stephen Rifkin photographed it and discovered some unusual characteristics. He had spaces between his upper front teeth and several spaces between uh, several of his lower front teeth. Investigators also found foreign skin cells underneath Donya's fingernails. Day by day, investigators were getting closer. Eight days after Donya da Costa's murder, detectives got a tip. Someone just two blocks from Donya's home drove a burgundy van 
that belonged to the Church of God. I received a phone call that there was a, a few men up in Deerfield Beach that utilized a Burgundy church van. They lived just to the north of the gas station. I went up to their house. Uh, we ended up um, surveilling them. Detectives Kaminsky and Bukata watched as four men got into the van and took off. The detectives pulled them over for a look around. Inside the van, they found a floral print dress, which matched the description of the dress Donya was wearing when she was last seen alive. Naturally, investigators confiscated the van, and Mark Zuckamel compared the van's tires to the tire impressions found near Donya's body. They did not match. Daphne Bose said that the dress I had wasn't her daughter's. So the van in question that we had stopped was not the van. None of the men had criminal records, and all willingly provided a DNA sample. And we were able to exclude all four of the individuals that were originally submitted as being a possible contributor to the, that foreign DNA that we had detected. The men were released, and the case went cold. At that point, I think we all thought that uh, Bukata and Kaminsky were going to be looking for a needle in the haystack. Then, four months after Darnia's murder, detectives on duty saw yet another van that caught their eye. And as I'm looking at the van, I'm starting to realize that the color was a teal color. And then I even looked a little further, and I saw the word hope on the side of the van. We both looked at each other and said, no, it couldn't be, because we're looking for what we believe to be a burgundy van. The van was parked in front of the Generation Hope Daycare in Fort Lauderdale. The daycare was affiliated with a local church, but not Donya's church. The van was obviously teal. It wasn't burgundy. However, the word hope, H-O-P-E, the letters themselves were burgundy in color. Detectives were greeted by the pastor. He said he wasn't driving the van on the night of Darnia's murder, but he was pretty sure he knew who was. The pastor was a meticulous man, and he kept detailed logs with dates and times. He began to look through his logs in the date in question when Dania was missing and subsequently murdered. During that time period, we learned that Lucius Boyd was the one who had the van. Lucius Boyd was the maintenance man at the daycare center and had been using the van to run errands the day before Donya disappeared. But according to the pastor's records, Boyd didn't return the van until several days later. Since the van wasn't needed, it didn't raise any alarms. When officers looked inside the van, they saw a purple laundry bag like the one found with Donya's body. Church officials also noted that a box of tools usually kept in the van was missing. A reciprocating saw was missing, a Torx screwdriver was missing. There was also a garment bag that was used to turn in dirty laundry to the cleaners. Uh, those items were missing. 39-year-old Lucius Boyd lived just two blocks away from the gas station where Darnia was last seen. Boyd denied any involvement but had no alibi for the time Dornia went missing. And he was no stranger to police. Over the last decade, he'd been charged seven times for violent offenses ranging from rape to murder, but was acquitted in every case. I did not do this, what they're talking about. I did not do this here. Boyd had also been a suspect in no less than 10 unsolved murders. He just wasn't ever convicted of any crime he did. And police worried that unless they found solid evidence, he might go free again. Lucius Boyd was the prime suspect in Dona da Costa's murder. Apparently, his employer at the daycare center knew of his arrest for violent crimes, but assumed his innocence since he had always been acquitted in court. When police questioned Boyd's live-in girlfriend, Geneva Lewis, 
she was more than cooperative. She said she was out of town visiting her family when the crime occurred. So police asked her if any of their bed sheets were missing. She looked through her closet and told me when she came back out that she was missing a yellow sheet and a brown sheet. These were the same colors as the sheets that wrapped Doña da Costa's body. And there was other potential evidence in the apartment. While I was talking with her, I looked into the bedroom, and I noticed that the carpet was brown in color. Doña's body had been covered in brown fibers. Crime scene technicians now scoured the apartment. In the bedroom, underneath the bed, they found blood stains. The carpet was saturated with blood. A fiber analysis showed the brown fibers on Dornia's body had come from the carpet in Boyd's apartment. The fingerprints on the plastic bags that encased Dornia's body didn't match Lucius Boyd, but they did match Boyd's girlfriend and their son. It links him in some way to association with the body that he claimed he had never had any contact with. The tire impressions on the sheet found with Dornia's body matched one of the tires on the daycare van. But without a murder weapon, prosecutors needed to determine how Dornia had been killed. The church pastor told investigators the make and model of the reciprocating saw missing from the van. Criminalist Alan Greenspan placed an identical saw over a scale photograph of the strange horseshoe-shaped wound on Donya's forehead. He was attempting to determine if the base of the saw, known as the foot, could have made the mark. Class characteristics, or the general appearance of the foot, was consistent with the mark. The wounds on Donya's chest were star-shaped. One of the tools missing from the van was a Torx driver, essentially a screwdriver with a star-shaped head. An identical Torx driver was overlaid on scale photos of the chest wounds, and the patterns lined up perfectly. And you think of that crime as a big puzzle, here's two pieces of the puzzle that kind of fit in. Casts were made of Boyd's teeth, and his bite pattern was consistent with the mark on Donya's arm. Within reasonable dental certainty, we were able to conclude that we would expect teeth like Lucius Boyd to have made the marks on the victim. And DNA testing proved it was Donya's blood in Boyd's apartment, and Boyd's DNA was found under Donya's fingernails. His profile that I was able to develop matched to the foreign DNA that I had already detected on the thigh swabs and on the mixtures under the fingernails. Prosecutors believe Donya trusted the man offering to give her a ride because he was well-dressed and apparently affiliated with a church. Once she accepted his offer for a ride, the evidence shows he grabbed the reciprocating saw and struck her in the head, creating the odd horseshoe-shaped bruise. He then took Darnia back to his apartment because his live-in girlfriend was away that night. Once there, he sexually assaulted Darnia, tortured her, and killed her with a blow to the head. He wrapped her body in sheets from his apartment and placed it in a plastic bag that had his girlfriend's fingerprints on it. He dumped the body in an industrial park and then drove over it, leaving behind the tire impression later matched to the van. The evidence conclusively proved that Lucius Boyd was the only person in the world that was responsible for the death of Donia da Costa. The only consolation I can get from this is that my sister was a gift to us. God gave her as a gift after a while, after so many years, he took her back. In January of 2002, Lucius Boyd was convicted of Dornia da Costa's murder. He was sentenced to death. Investigators believe Boyd killed at least 
two other women who mysteriously disappeared after he'd been in contact with them. I just hope that before Lucius Boyd gets executed, he's man enough to tell law enforcement, to tell me, to tell anybody where the bodies of these missing girls are. Family members want to know. And now, police and the community are grateful that Boyd is finally behind bars. Physical evidence doesn't lie. People do. People like Lucius Boyd can come up with any story they want, any lie. But Lucius Boyd will never be a match for physical evidence. Forensics in this case is critical. This is what set everything else from his criminal history in the past where he was not getting convicted to a conviction. We were able to pick up all these individual little uh, pieces of evidence that on their own may not be that important, but when you combine them all together, it leads us back to this individual and it locks them in.